Well, my experience during 9-11, uh, which was Tuesday, September 11th, I just finished up a night shift uh, for our division uh, deployment down at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And I was doing some emergency leaves and I went off to get breakfast. I was sitting there eating breakfast, enjoying my meal, when someone came running in and was looking for me in particular. They said, hey, a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. You know, Sergeant Heater, we need to get back to headquarters immediately. Well, I got back there and on our TVs we had there, they had CNN displayed and it showed the smoke pouring out of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Um, it was a lot of smoke and I knew at that time that my cousin worked in that tower on the 97th floor with Marsh McLean, a company there. So I watched kind of in you know, a little bit of shock. And then while we were watching, the second plane hit the South Tower. Um, immediately, everyone kind of went into mode on telephones, calling places. Um, I left the TV to go find out who we had, who may have had relatives who lived, you know, are from New York City itself proper. And it kind of got us all into a defensive mode of what is, you know, what is going on here. Uh, soon after, when the tower, South Tower collapsed and then the North Tower collapsed, um, I knew my cousin who had worked there um, most likely perished because I knew he was up on the high floor. And later on, I was confirmed that he did die. Uh, my cousin, Dennis Taramina, who was you know, the only volunteer firefighter and EMT uh, to perish in the World Trade Center versus the, all, the other professional uh, responders. Um, later on that morning, also, the Pentagon got hit. And at the Pentagon, I had several friends who worked there that I knew when they, right when I saw the impact, I knew that was their office area. Uh, days later, when we saw the casualty list. I saw other friends I knew at the, at the Pentagon who had perished, like Sergeant Major Ivory. Uh, Debbie, who was the general secretary, had worked with us over in Germany. And every year at 9-11 is definitely a sad time for us. Um, I'll never forget it. On 9-11-2001, I was a sophomore in college and I was asleep at the time because I had a knack for not taking early classes. Um, and so at, on 9-11, at that time, my, the phone rang while I was asleep and it was my mom and she said, you have to turn the television on right now. A plane just hit the World Trade Center. So I did and right as the plane hit, I turned it on right as the plane was hitting the second tower and I thought, and I said out loud, don't, don't do it. And um, then it happened, and then everything started happening really fast, and people were coming in the dorm rooms and saying, you have to come downstairs, we're all going to sit in one room, and they, you know, talked to us and tell us that, told us to feel safe at school, and I mean, it was hard because we were very young at the time, so, and the semester just started, so we, um, you know, it was scary to be away from home. So we all stayed together and then at some point somebody burst in and said, we all have to go to the roof. You can see the Pentagon, the smoke from the Pentagon. So we went to the roof of our building and, and sure enough it was up there. A few weeks before 9-11, I had been flip-flopping majors and I had decided to take a class in uh, fire protection engineering because it was a major that I thought maybe I could do some good and help people and make the world a little safer. And so I was really glad to see afterwards that my degree would do some good. And afterwards, my, my department at University of Maryland became one of the uh, research groups that went up and studied how the fires impacted the World Trade Center. My name is Cecil Fletcher. I'm a senior reactor inspector in Region 2. And my memories of September 11, 2001, I was still on active duty. I was a submarine officer stationed aboard the USS Norfolk. We were out to sea, hundreds of feet of water, underwater, and out of communication with the rest of the world. We had just finished a drill which required us to come to periscope depth, which is close to the surface, and download any communications that were awaiting us. When the captain came over the loudspeaker and he made an announcement, he said the United States is under attack. Now, like I said, we're in the middle of running drill, so everyone on the ship started scrambling and trying to figure out what to do in this scenario. And it was a couple minutes later when the captain came back over the speaker and he said, secure from drills. My last announcement was not a drill. It was an actual event. The United States is under attack. And it wasn't until minutes later that we got the news about the Pentagon and also the flight in Pennsylvania. And once again, being on the submarine, we were out of communication. There was no way for us to pick up a phone and try and dial and try and get a hold of our loved ones. 
And what, to make it even worse, we got orders to stay out to sea for a couple more weeks. And for two weeks, basically, we, you know, you were tortured, not knowing how your loved ones were or how your friends were, and you just hoped that you didn't get word back from the Red Cross for this whole two weeks. And I remember once we got back, they had stopped showing all of the videos and the pictures on TV because America was kind of in recovery mode. So it wasn't until a couple of days later that I actually saw the video and saw some pictures of the actual event. And it seemed like we were going through it real time again, you know, like it was happening all over again. So I went into a kind of a state of shock, you know, while everyone else was recovering. And, you know, we, we left a peaceful Norfolk, Virginia. We came back and everyone's covered, walking around with machine guns and sidearms. So it was a different world that I left. On 9-11, I was providing a workshop on license renewal in Moscow, Russia. During one of the breaks, one of the translators came to me and asked, had I heard about the airplanes crashing into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon? My initial impression was, I can't believe this. I can't believe that a plane could even get near our Pentagon. As I went home that afternoon to the Rosia Hotel where I was staying, I started seeing on the, on the TVs those airplanes crashing into the World Trade Center. And, but I couldn't understand it because the newscasters were speaking in Russian. And then when I got to the hotel to make phone calls, it was, the phone calls were problematic. I eventually made the phone calls because I was concerned about my family, the people, the, whether or not we would have additional attacks and also whether or not I could even get home because international flights had been canceled. I eventually made those, those phone calls and I was lucky and actually on the first fl flights back to the United States on the first day that they opened those flights, those international flights. My most memorable impression, however, was as I was going into the U.S. Embassy to extend my visa, there were flowers everywhere, over the gates, over the grounds. And I was told that it was from the Russian people who were sympathetic to our nation's tragedy. On 9-11, I was active duty Navy, uh, assigned to SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2 down in uh, Little Creek, Virginia. I uh, left active duty Navy, uh, was a reservist for a number of years and uh, was mobilized in 2000, late 2007 to, through 2008 to Afghanistan, uh, stationed uh, in uh, Polacharki, Afghanistan, which is uh, halfway between Kabul and Jalalabad, so the central eastern section of the country. Being a Navy reservist and a submarine officer uh, in a, for a landlocked country, I did not uh, anticipate being mobilized, especially in support of Afghanistan. You know, there were other locations in the world where the Navy was being used, um, but uh, with respect to what was going on in Iraq, um, the United States started using in lieu of forces that, so we were starting to use Air Force and Navy personnel in lieu of Army and Marine Corps who were already strapped in Iraq. It was a big shocker. We, were, we, had, we had relocated for the agency it was never going to be an easy time to mobilize, but certainly that where we had moved my family to a place where we didn't know anyone, I had just bought a home, and then I was gone for a year. So it was challenging not only for me, but for my family as well. Well, you know, that day of 9-11 was a beautiful September day, you know, and it was like a day full of promise and, and excitement. And we had a retreat. I was a manager in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. We were having a management retreat off-site. And so we're all gathering at this uh, building uh, up in Rockville. And uh, word comes from one of the workers there at the uh, facility. He's watching TV. He says, oh, man, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. Oh, really? So some of us gathered around the TV and, and trying to get a sense of what's going on. So I really didn't think all that much of it other than the fact, wow, that was really kind of weird. So we're getting ready to start the meeting and then word comes a second plane hits the World Trade Center. Well now, it's like there's something weird going on here and, and what really is happening. And it really, within a matter of maybe 15 or so minutes, 
we're starting to get a sense of something more significant is going on. Uh, and then another 15 or 20 minutes, we get word that the Pentagon was hit. So now it's like, should we even have this retreat? What is, what is, we're under attack, apparently. Uh, and, and it still wasn't necessarily instantaneous at that time that we knew that there was some terrorist action going on, but everybody could sort of piece together what was happening. And, and to be honest with you, we finally made the decision to, to go through with the retreat, but it was a blur. And, and really, I think it was really just a way to spend time until we could get done for the day and go home. And, and that's really what I was really focused on, is getting home, being with my family. I'm sure a lot of people at that time, you're starting to question, gee, is this nation under attack? You know, what's going to happen next? Uh, and, and so just getting home and being with the family really was the focus. Uh, at the time, I had actually a security branch that worked for me. It was about 10 or 11 people. And, and who knew that within several years, this organization would come from a small branch to a, a large office, the Office of Nuclear Security Incident Response. Um, and that me personally were asked to um, report to the operations center and be part of, of the shift not unlike what we've done recently uh, post Fukushima where you had the operations center around the clock. We did that for months after the events of 9-11. I think it's probably the most significant event I will see and experience in my lifetime. My 9-11 experience, um, I was working at Applebee's in Prince Frederick, Maryland and it was just like a normal work day. Going into work at my normal work time which is like 6 o'clock. I'm going to say it was about 8 o'clock when the first um, the first plane hit one of the Twin Towers. And even though we were so focused on doing what we were supposed to do, we all just stopped. All of the employees that were coming in that day, they stopped and they just watched the TV. That's all we did for like the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes just watching it. And I remember just sitting there and just asking to myself, like, oh my God, like, what in the world just happened? And, but when I saw the second plane hit, I just cried. Like, I just got so emotional. And I, I think a lot of the employees in, my office, in um, the restaurant got emotional. Like they, just, they just prayed. And I'm just wondering, like, what in the world is going on? And we still have, I, it was still my job that day as a manager to open up the store. So I go into the, into the kitchen, get my staff ready to go, and we're prepping food, and we have the video on in the kitchen in the back area. And as I'm listening to the radio, I just cut myself, and I had to go to the hospital because I was so... I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. I was just listening to the radio and hearing what was happening. So when I went to the hospital to go get my finger looked at, people were just crying. People were, not the fact that they were in pain, but they were just, they were just shocked. They were just worried. You know, they were wondering if this is going to happen again. People were talking about it in the restaurant. People were talking about it at the hospital. That night when I went home, I just, I cried. And I remember just sitting there and just praying and just asking God, like, why did this happen and, you know, why all the, all the people had to die like that? I mean, thousands and thousands of people had to die and people lost their brothers, sisters, grandparents. I mean, people lost a lot. They lost a lot of people. And I didn't have anyone um, personally die to me, but I felt like someone did because you've seen all these people die. You hear about the families and they're looking for their loved ones. You feel connected to them because of what happened.